likes to talk about easy reptiles and difficult reptiles, but what about the ones in the middle? If you're looking for a little bit of a step up from what you already have, something a little bit more fulfilling and challenging, today we're going over the top five intermediate reptiles. My name's Adam, this is Diamond, you're watching Wicked's Wicked Reptiles, stick around. Now, full transparency, the lighting's about to get better and so is the audio. We uh, filmed the first four minutes of this video with no audio about four hours ago. So, top five intermediate reptiles. The ones, basically what we're talking about here are reptiles that aren't easy, they're not difficult. Basically, anyone with a little bit of experience can take care of them. They just take a little bit of extra work in comparison to a corn snake, leopard gecko, something like that. So. Let's start it off with the one that I have to re-record here. Number five, Chinese crested geckos. Nope, that's not it. Chinese water dragons is what I'm trying to say here. I was going like cave gecko and crested gecko and neither of those on the list. Chinese water dragons are freaking awesome. Now, these things might get to three feet. So you might be thinking, well, dude, I see these at pet stores all the time. They're 40 bucks. What are you talking about? They're easy. You put them in a 40 gallon, wham, bam, Bob's your Uncle Fran's your aunt, you're done. No, that's not right. That's probably what PetSmart will tell you, but they're wrong. You can't keep a three foot, up to three foot animal in a 40 gallon enclosure. How long is a 40? Well, that's not long enough to house a three foot animal. It's kind of silly. Now, obviously these aren't the most difficult things in the world. I hate that PetSmart sells them for 40 bucks. I was at the fish store the other day. There was a tiny little pet section there for reptiles, a few enclosures, and it wasn't like there was a corn snake and a leopard gecko. No, no, no. It was like there was several water dragons and they were cheap. They're like 40 or 50 bucks. And if you look at their pamphlets that they have there and how to take care of them, they say you stick them in a 40, but they need water, they need branches, because they, they are semi-arboreal also, and you need to make sure that you're giving them the right environment. Now, I think we've talked enough. We can probably go back to the first recording. Anyway, all right, past Adam, take it away. Now, don't get me wrong, these can be great pets, but they're not great pets if you take care of them the way that a care guide from say like a pet smart is gonna tell you to do it. It's just not enough space for them. They need more height for sure than a 40 gallon. So if you have a custom built enclosure or even a grow tent, I know people like to keep them in those, uh, that would probably be better. Another thing too, a lot of people keep them in areas where they don't see the glass on the ground, simply because they do this thing called nose rubbing, which Alex is a gamids, thank you so much for allowing me to use your footage here. These are his water dragons. He got these animals like this from someone who didn't know how to take care of them properly. They surf the glass constantly and it damaged their face. So these guys, what I'm trying to say here, are amazing animals, super rewarding, but you just need more than you would need with like a leopard gecko or something that's easy. Number four, something you don't hear nearly enough about, Maclots pythons. Now these are very similar to similar pythons. This are very similar to similar pythons. No way. They're very similar to say Savu pythons. Now Maclots pythons are semi-arboreal animals. You're gonna find them in the trees most of the time. And these are not tiny animals at all. We're talking six to eight feet. These guys are gonna be bigger than you in terms of length, but they don't get super bulky. They're not dangerous to you. So Maclots pythons aren't gonna kill a human or, or hurt a human. But there is one thing that I hear a lot about Maclots pythons that turns out isn't even that accurate. A lot of people say they are extremely aggressive, which isn't really true at all. I mean, if you don't socialize them, that could be the case. But that's the same thing with, say, a blood python or even a BCI, a very common pet, a boa constrictor, emperor, or constrictor. Either way, those guys, if you don't socialize them, well, they're gonna be mean too, but you never hear about how bad their attitude is. Well, Maclats pythons, I think because there's not a ton of captive breeding going on, and you need to socialize them when they're younger most of the time to get them to a state where you can handle them without taking a pop, it's just more rare to find them in a good temperament than it is something like a boa, which you find and they're almost always captive when you get them or captive bred, I should say. Where Maclats pythons, you're seeing it more often now that there are people who are breeding them. And I think that you're gonna find a resurgence in the popularity, although they're not super easy to find and they're not super cheap either. They can be kind of expensive. 
I think that these guys are amazing animals and so beautiful. Oh yeah, never mind active and fun to watch. So if you want, say, a big display enclosure that's not only long but tall because of their size and how they use it, then this might be the perfect animal because they're gonna be cruising around all the time and they're super fun to handle. So all in all, I think they are wickedly underrated and a perfect intermediate reptile for a lot of people. Number three intermediate reptile, Euromastix. Now I have a Euromastix and I think he's the perfect example of why it's an intermediate animal, not a beginner animal because they're so varied. Now most bearded dragons, which they're kind of similar to in a lot of ways, uh, they're like this. I mean, I can like, he doesn't care at all. He'll just chill here for literally hours. Where Euromastix, you can get them like that, where they just chill, they do nothing, they soak up the heat of your body. There's other ones like mine, Magmar, who is super skittish. This is another case of socialize them while they're young, because if you don't, it's harder when they're adults. To the point where Magmar, I mean, I've been working on him for a long time. I almost never show him on the channel because it's almost impossible to get good footage of him. He's a red Saharan, but there are many species of Euromastix. You can get Egyptians that get to like three feet long. There are ornates, which look amazing. And then there's the more common Saharans and things like that. And there's a bunch of different other ones as well. Now, the one common with these is they like it very dry and very hot. And this is another reason that they're an intermediate level in my opinion, because a lot of people can't handle giving a basking spot over 130 degrees in a lot of cases. I mean, we're talking hot, super duper hot, their basking spot, and also dry, which the light helps with, but let's suppose you live in somewhere like, I don't know, Southern Ontario, where I live, or maybe you live in Florida, Southern Florida, where it's super humid for part of the year, or most of the year. Well, it might be difficult for you to keep one of these at the right humidity level. Now, that's not to say they're bad pets. They're super rewarding. I love Euromastics. I remember the first time I saw them at a pet shop a few minutes down the road from here, and I remember seeing them in a huge, we're talking 300 gallon enclosure. It was massive, probably almost eight feet long. They had this really cool outcrop of rocks and this background. You could tell whoever made it put a ton of work into it. And these guys looked fantastic. Now, don't go and just cohab reptiles because I said that it's possible. Do your research on how to do it first, but Euromastics can be successfully cohabbed, although they do fantastic by themselves as well. Now, one thing to watch out for, because they are not an animal that is going to bite you likely, what they do instead is they tail whip and they've got these spiny tails. A lot of their uncommon names or their slang names for the species are spiny tail this, spiky tail that. And these guys, they'll wedge themselves in rock crevices and just show that tail uh, to predators. So it is a defense mechanism. They can hit you with it pretty hard and it doesn't feel great. But what's cool about the diet of these guys, unlike the water dragons we talked about earlier, which were insectivores, these guys almost never eat insects. They're gonna eat things like lentils and seeds. Uh, they're gonna eat things like greens, of course. I put bee pollen on the greens sometimes just as a little treat for them. So their diet is very different. There's not that many reptiles that eat seeds and these guys do. It's kind of weird. But you know what's not weird? Number two, water snakes. I'm talking about the Nerodia family. Now these guys are from North America. They usually don't get, uh, I would say two to three and a half feet depending on the species because there's many different species of water snakes. Now growing up, I grew up around Lake Ontario and Lake Erie. There's actually a water snake that is a Lake Erie water snake that's only found in Lake Erie. So there's a bunch of different ones that I've found. Now herping for these guys, I noticed something they have big teeth and they are not afraid to use them in the wild. But something that I learned recently from a couple people that I know, friends of mine who have them, is that in captivity, they're much less reluctant to use their two defense mechanisms or the two main ones, their teeth, they bite and they're fast at doing it by the way. But the other thing in the wild that I noticed about Nerodia is they stink. They produce a musk. Now, a lot of species do this. Decays brown snakes, garter snakes. There's a bunch of different species who will do this. And what they do is they omit kind of like this disgusting sludge out of their cloaca. And it's uh, called musk. It smells disgusting and it's sticky. It's hard to get off your hands. It's meant to basically smell like a dead animal because what wants to eat a dead animal? Not very much. But because these guys eat fish and amphibians, they stink like way worse than most other reptiles I've ever had musk on me. It smells disgusting. The problem is finding captive red water snakes. 
Now these guys are live bearers and they do produce a decent amount in a litter, but they're just not that common because they don't really get a good rap and also just, I mean, they're a water snake. You need a land area, you need a water area and anything that's semi-aquatic that needs a larger enclosure is just harder and more expensive to facilitate for most people. But in my opinion, Nerodia are very underrated and another species or group of species that I think you're going to see ascend in popularity and you're gonna start seeing them on Instagram, Facebook, your local reptile shop, your friend's house. I think you're gonna start seeing them pretty much everywhere in the next five years or so. Number one, not only is underrated, but I think probably the best intermediate reptile that there is, period, Dumeril's boas. Now I know that I talk about them too much, but I think that they get not enough credit for what they are, which is a big, heavy-bodied snake that is terrestrial, so you don't need to worry about fancy heights and things like that. They're easy to feed, they are beautiful, and they are kind of slow. Now mine, both of my adults that I have, Kangaskhan and Marowak, instead of like, kind of going after rats, when I, they kind of just kind of look around, like what the heck is this thing? They're just kind of smelling it, and then they'll gently open their mouth and start to, like, they're so gentle, they're so beautiful, I love these animals. Dumeril's boas are fun to hang on to, they are one of the strongest snakes per size, per per size, for this, their size, they're the strongest snake that I've ever held, by far, not even close. They are so strong, and they don't get that big. We're talking about, well, some will say three to six feet. I've never seen one as small as three, but let's say four to seven feet on average. Although you can get some eight or nine footers, the ones that I have are both around six foot. The one I have is close to seven. Kangaskhan is actually pretty big and he's a male. And this is as big as he's gonna get. He's not gonna get any bigger than this. I think he was born in 2017, so that would make him four years old. And uh, hopefully he's gonna be a good breeder for me next year when we're ready to breed Dumeril's boas, which are a live bearer. They're from Madagascar. They're just all around so unique. And just look at the color difference between, these are both normals by the way. This is Kangaskhan and this is Marowak. Marowak is much darker and she just always is. It's so interesting that a normal next to a normal can look so different. And I'm sure you'll be seeing them in the B-roll. Hey, just a special shout out. It's not a sponsored thing. They paid me no money at all. They just sent me a pair to see if I liked them. Zilla footwear. I got the corn snake ones. They're pretty dope. I stopped wearing Converse shoes or the style, the style of shoes a while ago because I've got sensitive feet. My feet get sore. These have like a built-in insole. Man, Zilla, you guys are rocking it. You guys are awesome. Okay, that's it. Are actually, were we done now? What else do we talk about? Anyway, what I'm trying to say here is whether you get a male or female, Dumeril's boas, in my opinion, are the very best, the very best intermediate reptile that you can get. If you want to know more, there's a video right here. But that's it though. I think that's, those are five, right? That's five, one, two, three, four, five. Thank you so much for hitting like, for hitting subscribe. You guys are freaking amazing. And of course, as always, a special thank you to the Patreon supporters. You guys are freaking amazing. You get to know about extra things, videos early. You know about the reptile in my collection I keep talking about, but I don't actually talk about. Anyway, check Patreon for as little as a dollar a month. You get to see all that stuff. And um, that we just really appreciate it. Me and Diamond, we're like big fans. Rah, rah. Anyway, uh, that's it. Now we plugged absolutely everything. Because I do videos twice a week, that means I'll see you on Monday.